Father, we thank thee that thou art so good to us. We don't deserve it, but you died for us. Help us to see who you really are, that we may surrender joyfully, willingly, and knowing that you have done something for us we could never have asked. Help us to understand the plan of salvation as it's shown to us in the sanctuary. Let us understand it clearly, and then let us move into your plan. Amen. Okay, today we begin with Our High Calling, page 336. Now, before we read that, I would like to remind you, we are looking at the statements of the Spirit of Prophecy through the eyes of the sanctuary. There are statements that fit one place, they don't fit in another place. The statements we are looking at right now are statements concerning a person who is not a Christian. They may be going to church every week and do everything that church people do. But if you read carefully, these people are not Christians. They are a natural man. Now we're reading these to notice they are not about Christianity. They're about pre-Christianity. And when we reach justification, those are very clear statements from there on, you are in Christianity. The statements we're reading today are the natural man who goes to church and does everything else right, but he is not a Christian. So let's continue here. Our High Calling, page 336. Many are sensible of their great deficiency, and they read and pray and resolve and yet make no progress. See? See that? They're praying, they're resolving, but nothing happens. They seem to be powerless to resist temptation. The reason is they do not go deep enough. They do not seek for a thorough conversion of the soul, that the streams which issue from it may be pure, and the department may testify that Christ reigns within. So this person is fooling themselves. They tell themselves they're a Christian. They do everything Christians do. But they do not make progress. They don't change. 3T528. The righteousness of Christ consists in right actions and good works from pure unselfish motives. Now that has nothing to do with righteousness by faith. There is no righteousness by faith in that. Outside righteousness, while the inward adoring is wanting, will be of no avail. 1T190, many I saw were flattering themselves that they were good Christians who have not a single ray of light from Jesus. They know not what it is to be renewed by the grace of God. They have no living experience for themselves in the things of God. And I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. Oh, what every lukewarm professor could realize, the clean work that God is about to make among his professed people. 2T176, were you called? There would be some hope for you. <laughs> that you would be converted. But where self-righteousness, that's righteousness by faith, self-righteousness girds one about instead of the righteousness of Christ. The deception is so difficult to be seen. An unconverted, godless sinner stands in a more favorable condition than such. 3T252 what greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are all wrong? The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception. So we're reading about people who go to church, but they're not Christians. They know 
Their condition is deplorable in the sight of God, while those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in exalted spiritual condition. The message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition and spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. The testimony so cutting and severe cannot be a mistake. For it is the true witness who speaks, and his testimony must be correct. Our high calling 349, they may be crying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we. While their hearts are filled with unholy traffic and unrighteous barter, the courts of the soul temple may be the haunt of envy, pride, passion, evil, surmising, bitterness, and hollow formalism. Christ looks mournfully upon his professed people who feel rich and increased in the knowledge of the truth and who are yet destitute of the truth of life and character. Mount of Blessings 94. He who does not give himself wholly to God is under the control of another power. Listening to another voice whose suggestions are entirely different character. Half and half service places the human agent on the side of the enemy as a successful ally of the hosts of darkness. Early writings 270. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half-heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who are truly receive it will obey and be purified. So once more we run into the word. Obedience comes when we are fully surrendered. No other time. Christ Object Lessons 237. Every time you fail to open the door of your heart to Christ, you become more and more unwilling to listen to the voice of Him that speaketh. You diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy. The Holy Spirit is presenting every inducement to constrain you to come. Christ is watching for some sign that will be token the removing of the bolts and the opening of the door of your heart for his entrance. So Jesus is waiting around many, many Christians hoping they will come to repentance. They call themselves Christians, but they're not. 7 B.C. 965. The eye is the sensitive conscience, the inner light of the mind. Upon its correct way of things, the spiritual healthfulness of the whole soul and being depends. The eye salve of the Word of God makes the conscience smart under its application, for it convicts of sin. But the smarting is necessary that the healing may follow and the eye be single to the glory of God. SD 292, just where the conscience of the Bible a Christian warns him to forbear, to deny himself, to stop. Just there, the whirling steps over the line to indulge his selfish propensity. Now, she changed the word there. Instead of calling him the natural man, she called him the whirling. On one side of the line is the self denying follower of Jesus Christ. On the other side is the self-indulgent world lover, pandering in fashion, engaging in frivolity, and pampering himself in forbidden pleasure. Evangelism, page 642. The disposition to say witty things that will create a laugh when the wants of the cause are under consideration, whether in committee meeting, a board meeting, or any other meeting for business, is not of Christ. The flippant words that fall from his lips, the trifling anecdotes, the words spoken to create a laugh, are all condemned 
by the word of God and are entirely out of place in the sacred desk. 2SG 283 Sins exist in the church that God hates, but they are scarcely touched for fear of making enemies. Opposition has arisen in the church to the plain testimony. If the wrongs of individuals are touched, they complain of severity and sympathize with those in the wrong. They are ready to look with suspicion and doubt upon those who bear the plain testimony. Desire of Ages 111 As one with us, we must bear the burden of our guilt and woe. The sinless one must feel the shame of sin. The peace lover must dwell with strife. The truth must abide with falsehood, purity with vileness. Every sin, every discord, every defiling lust that transgression had brought was torture to his spirit. Now, we need to pay attention to that. The things that were torture to his spirit should be torture to our spirit. If they're not, we are denying Christ. Steps to Christ, page 54. Can you believe that when the poor sinner longs to return, longs to forsake his sins, the Lord sternly withholds him from coming to his feet in repentance? Away with such thoughts. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner and he gave himself in the person of Christ that all who would might be saved. Now that one takes some reading to understand what she's saying. Desire of Ages 300, we often sorrow because our evil deeds bring unpleasant consequences to ourselves. But this is not repentance. Real sorrow for sin is the result of the working of the Holy Spirit. And of course she means the Holy Spirit of Christ. The Spirit reveals the ingratitude of the heart that has slighted and grieved the Savior and bring us in contrition to the foot of the cross. By every sin, Jesus is wounded afresh. By every sin, Jesus is wounded afresh, and as we look upon him whom we have pierced, we mourn for the sins that have brought anguish upon him. Such mourning will lead to the renunciation of sin. And that is not a maybe statement. That's what happens. We renounce sin when we see what it does to Jesus. Desire of Ages 176. If we do not resist this drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. Then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul. The thoughts and the desires are brought into obedience to the will of Christ. So this is the process we're looking at. The natural man is looking, how do I become a Christian? Well, the, here's how it is. Our thoughts and desires are brought into the obedience to the will of Christ. The heart, the mind, are created anew in the image of Him who works in us to subdue all things to Himself. 4220, you have yet to learn the great lesson of faith. When you surrender yourselves entirely to God, when you fall all broken upon Christ, you will be rewarded by a victory, the joy of which you have never yet experienced. She's talking to people in church. You have never yet experienced this. 1 SM 330, but you say, this surrender of all my idols will break my heart. <laughs> This giving up for God is represented by your falling upon the rock and being broken. Then give up all for him, for unless you are broken, you are worthless. Acts of the Apostles 2.99 The surrender must be complete. 
every weak, doubting, struggling soul who yields fully to the Lord is placed in direct touch with agencies that enable him to overcome. Faith and Works, page 30. The doctrine which teaches freedom through grace to break the law is a fatal disillusion. Every transgressor, every transgressor of God's law is a sinner. Now, we, we have been instructed in the church that everybody is a sinner anyhow. <laughs> so what difference does it make if you sin a little bit? Everybody has to sin some. That's not what this says. Every transgressor of God's law is a sinner, and none can be sanctified while living in sin. So there is no sanctification for a person who is a sinner, and a person who transgresses the law is a sinner. We think we're okay because all we have to do is confess. That's not what it's about. Desire of Ages 555. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is a principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. Holiness is wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of of heaven. Well, so far we may not see that we're at fault here. Let's look at a statement that clears, clears it up a bit. Christ's Object Lessons 331. Let no one say, I cannot remedy my defects of character. <laughs> Let no one say that. If you come to this decision, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. So if you think you cannot stop sitting with Christ, you will not have everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. So people don't realize it, but they have decided it. I cannot overcome. I will never have a perfect character. I must sin. If they decide all that stuff, that's what they're going to do. Patriarchs and Prophets 384. God does not force the will of any. Hence, he cannot lead those who are too proud to be taught, who are bent upon having their own way. Of the double-minded man, he who seeks to follow his own will while professing to do the will of God. It is written, let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. James 1, 7. Now, I believe that's a pretty plain statement. We think we can ask Jesus for things and he must do them because we have asked. But we don't meet any of the conditions for it. We have not surrendered to him. We have not given him our will, our mind, nothing. We need to pay attention to the Bible. Testimonies to Ministers 4, 41. Christ has not died for you that you may possess the passions, states, and habits of the men of the world. To continue to be a worldling. Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 251. Jesus died not to save man in his sins, but from his sins. Man is to leave the error of his ways to follow the example of Christ, to take up his cross and follow him, denying self and obeying God at any cost. Now, people read these kinds of statements and take up the cross, follow him, denying self. They all read that. But for some reason, the, brain, the mind shuts off. And they don't even see it. The rest of the statement says, and obeying God at any cost. That's what it's really saying. 1T341. Fallen man is Satan's lawful captive. Lawful captive. He belongs to him. 
fallen man. And there isn't a single human that's ever been born that is not a fallen man. The mission of Christ was to rescue him from the power of his great adversary. Man is naturally inclined. Man, that's every man that's ever been born, is naturally, he's a natural man, naturally inclined to follow Satan's suggestions. They all come from Satan. Man does not normally think of doing evil all the time, but Satan is giving him suggestions. And he cannot successfully resist so terrible a foe unless Christ, the mighty conqueror, dwells in him, guiding his desires and giving him strength. God alone can limit the power of Satan. Well, how does Jesus get inside of a man? It says, unless Christ, the mighty conqueror, dwells in him, guiding his desires. How does he get inside? Through his Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in him. Signs of the Times, September 12, 1892. Many have an inheritance of unchristlike traits of character that are strong by heredity and stronger by cultivation. The least crossing of their will arouses their combativeness and upsets their temper. While they are thus unemptied of self, they cannot expect to receive answers to their prayers. Did you get that? While well, they have a temper, they cannot get answers to their prayers. For evil tempers and corrupt inclinations will make prayer of none effect. The psalmist says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Our heart calling 147. There are thousands of prayers daily offered that God does not answer. There are faithless prayers. There are selfish prayers proceeding from a heart that is cherishing idols. There are petulant, fretful prayers murmuring because of the burdens and cares of life instead of humbly seeking grace to lighten them. Those who offer such petitions are not abiding in Christ. They have not submitted their will to the will of God. They do not comply with the condition of the promise, and it is not fulfilled to them. Mount of Blessing 52 Whenever men choose their own way, they place themselves in controversy with God. They will have no place in the kingdom of heaven. For they are at war with the very principle of heaven. In disregarding the will of God, they are placing themselves on the side of Satan, the enemy of God and man. Not by one word, not by many words, but by every word that God has spoken shall man live. We cannot disregard one word, however trifling it may seem to us, and be saved. 5T682 As man yields to temptation and indulges in sin, his mind becomes darkened. The moral sense is perverted. The warnings of conscience are disregarded and his voice is less clearly heard. He gradually loses the power to distinguish between right and wrong until he has no true sense of his standing before God. He may observe forms of religion. You see, he goes to church and zealously maintain his doctrine. Yes, the words of the doctrine, while destitute of its spirit. Great Controversy 472. You ought to read this whole page. Let none deceive themselves with the belief that they can become holy while willfully violating one of God's requirements. The commission of a known sin silences the witnessing of the Spirit and separates the soul from God. Review and Herald, April 21. 
1891, we have slept too long. Shall we sleep on? Now she's talking about people who go to church are not converted. And there are many of those. We have slept too long. Shall we sleep on and be lost at last? Are there those here who have been sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting? That's the way people live their lives. Sin and repent, sin and repent, sin and repent. And will they continue to do so till Christ shall come? May God help us that we may be truly united to Christ the living vine and bear fruit to the glory of God. 2T 263. Some persons make their religious life a failure because they are always wavering and do not have determination. They are frequently convicted and come almost up to the point of surrendering all to God. <laughs> almost, but failing to meet the point, they fall back again. So they sin, they repent, they confess, they sin. Between the sin and the confessing, they almost come to Christ, they almost surrender, but when they have sinned, they've gone backwards. So if, as long as they keep sinning, they will never come to surrender. While in this state, of the conscience is hardening and becoming less and less susceptible to the impressions of the Spirit of God. His Spirit has warned, has convicted, and has been disregarded until it's nearly grieved away. God will not be trifled with. He shows duty clearly, and if there is neglect to follow the light, it becomes darkness. So the light becomes darkness. That's unfathomable. How does that happen? The light actually doesn't become darkness, but the light no longer works in us. We don't see the light. We see the darkness. And that's what it becomes to us, darkness. 1692. Satan does not want anyone to see the necessity of an entire surrender to God. Do you think that's true? It's Satan who does not want anyone to see it's necessary to surrender to God. When the soul fails to make this surrender, sin is not forsaken. Well, we have the answer to that. Why do people sin and confess, sin and confess, sin and confess? They have not surrendered. And it says so right here. When the soul fails to make this surrender, sin is not forsaken. We think we have to do it. The appetites and the passions are striving for the mastery. Temptations confuse the conscience so that true conversion does not take place. Well, we can read all these things over and over and over. People can read them to us, and we still don't surrender. Why? Because we still believe in sin. We think we have to do it, but we don't. It's only the perverseness of our soul that tells us that. Messages to young people, 105. We have little idea of the strength that would be ours if we would connect with the source of all strength. We fall into sin again and again and think it must always be so. We cling to our infirmities as if they were everything to be proud of. Well, that's the truth of it. We think we, we are proud that we continue to sin because we know we can't stop sinning. And we're proud of it. We think everybody's proud of it. But that's not the way it is. Review and Errol, March 15th, 1906. Christ came to this earth and lived a life of perfect obedience. We say, well, yes, he was God. But he did not come to live as God. 
he came to be a man. And it was as a man he obeyed. That proves we can obey. That men and women through his grace might also live lives of perfect obedience. Now we have lived with this lie so long that it doesn't make sense to us. We can perfectly obey. <laughs> perfect obedience. This is necessary to their salvation. God's law is the transcript of his character, and those only who obey his, this law will be accepted by him. Every departure from obedience to the law of God is rebellion. Are we proud of rebellion? Well, the people who continue to sin are proud of their rebellion. But that rebellion is not going to go to heaven. We must learn to obey perfectly, and we have a lifetime to do it. Evangelism 192. Penances, mortifications of the flesh, constant confession of sin, without sincere repentance, fast, festival, outward observances unaccompanied by true devotion. All these are of no value, whatever. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. He made a whole efficacious offering to God. And human effort without the merit of Christ is worthless. Now, these are the kind of people who are going to church every week, doing everything the church people are supposed to do. But what they're doing is worthless. They're leaving Christ out of it. They're trying to do it by themselves. Review and Herald, August 19th, 1890. Are we wise virgins, or must we be classed among the foolish? This is the question which we are deciding today by our character and attitude. That which passes with many for the religion of Christ is made up of ideas and theories, a mixture of truth and error. That's what people who know all the scriptures and all the spirit positive statements but do not have a changed life. They have a theory. Some are trying to become good enough to be saved. They continually complain of their sins. And the Lord says to them, This have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord of tears and weeping and crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. Malachi 2.13 That's where many people are today, just doing everything church people do. They don't know another way. They don't know how to give it all to Christ. This day with God, 261, many allow their minds to dwell upon their unworthiness as though this was a virtue. <laughs> it is a hindrance to their coming to Jesus in a full assurance of faith. They should feel their unworthiness and because of this, because of their sinfulness, should feel the necessity of coming to the Savior who is their worthiness and who will be their righteousness if they repent and humble themselves. Their unworthiness is a self-evident fact. Jesus Christ's worthiness is a sure thing. Then let the doubting soul take hope and courage because he has one who is worth to be his Savior. There are many, many more statements in the Spirit of Prophecy like this. We just read 83. <laughs> 83 statements about what a person is like, what they do, how they live, who think they're Christians, go to church, do everything, but their life is worthless. They have not changed. Now, if these are the only kinds of statements we had to read, we could, all of us, just lay down and die. <laughs> yes, there'd be nothing else to look forward to. But now I'm going to start reading a few justification statements to show us there's hope. Jesus has done something that gives us hope if we believe, 
if we stop believing the devil's lies and get over to where Jesus is, we may do it. So let's not leave the lost person where they are. If that's where they want to stay, they've made their choice. Let's look at the people who are going to be saved. Let's see how they live. Let's see how they look at things. Let's see what they have surrendered to. And they know they have surrendered. Now, they may give off a faith somewhere in their life. Yes, they may do something that is not a faith. And they're sorry instantly. And they repent. And Jesus takes them back. They may have to be re-justified. But he will take them back. But let's see that we are at least on the road. We're on the true path of salvation. Let's now, after reading all these statements that are not part of the sanctuary at all, it's just people thinking they're part of it. We are now moving into the sanctuary to see how the plan of salvation works. It's not what's being taught in the churches. Let's see what God says. Now, please, in the notes, put down, we are now in the sanctuary. <laughs> Desire of Ages 175. Through faith, we receive the grace of God. But faith is not our Savior. A person who is being saved by Christ does not believe faith is their savior. Now that's not most of the people in the church. They think faith is their savior. Let me read it again. Through faith, we receive the grace of God, but faith is not our savior. It earns nothing. <laughs> so faith doesn't earn anything. It is the hand by which we lay hold on Christ and appropriate His merits. There's where salvation is, the remedy for sin. You'll want to read that over and over again. That chapter is amazing. It's on Nicodemus. Review and Herald, October 1, 1901. Many keep the truth in the outer court. That's before you come into the sanctuary. Its sacred principles have not a controlling influence over the words, the thoughts, the actions. They do not possess the faith which works by love and purifies the soul. See, they're still lost. An assent to the truth may quiet the conscience, but let every believer inquire, Does my faith make me daily, hourly a follower of Christ? This is a person who is in obedience. They're being sanctified. To be a means to a saving end, the Word of God must be intelligently and practically understood and obeyed. You see, the word obedience is always there in salvation. Desire of Ages 126. But faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Now, what's the difference between faith and presumption? People say the same things in faith and presumption, but they're doing something, too. They are obeying what their faith says. So obedience is where they go. Presumption it is a condition. Uh, it, the condition for presumption is no faith. The condition for faith is Obedience. Let's see how she finishes this. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. Faith would have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey His commands. Faith always does that. It leads a person to obey Him. Presumption 
led them to transgress his law. Presumption always does that. We just presume that I can sin, confess, for, get forgiveness, and be there again. Sin, confess, and again. Sin, confess. And it is not faith that claims the favor of heaven without complying with the conditions on which mercy is to be granted. The condition is obedience. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and the provisions of the scriptures. That means we obey whatever God says. Steps to Christ 44. In giving ourselves to God, we must necessarily give up all that would separate us from him. All. Now, is that going to kill us? Well, if it did, we'd have heaven. <laughs> but it doesn't. <laughs> Whosoever he be of you that's forsaken, not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. The Bible said it the whole time. That's Luke fourteen thirty three. Whatever shall draw away the heart from God must be given up. Now, that's what a Christian does. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. These people are in the sanctuary. That's what they're doing. 1SN 366. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duty. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. That's what every true Christian knows, that they had to make a full surrender before Jesus would justify them. If they have made the full surrender, they have nothing to worry about. They live before God as though they had never sinned. But if they have not done this, they have a lot to worry about. Upward look, 169. Christ invites all to come to him. But when they come, they are to lay aside their sins. Now Jesus said, come to me, come to me. He never said, come to us, the Trinity. He never said it. A simple thing is that. Denies the Trinity, the Trinity is a lie. Come to me. But when people come to Jesus, they're coming to learn of him to take his example, to live like him, to be forgiven. That's what it means here. They lay aside their sins, all their vices and follies, all their pride and worldliness are to be laid at the foot of the cross. This he requires because he loves them and desires to save them, not in their sins, but from their sins. Review and Herald, July 2nd, 1895. They must know the terms of salvation. Every Christian knows the terms of salvation. They must be taught that our conditions of acceptance are the same now as they were in Adam's day. Obedience to all God's commandments. That's what every Christian knows. Now go to church and start asking people, what are the conditions of salvation? They will not say obedience. They will say faith. They don't know faith is not your savior. These statements are so plain to Christians, but they are not plain to anybody else. Desire of Ages 181. We can receive of heaven's light only as we are willing to be emptied of self. We cannot discern the character of God or accept Christ by faith unless we consent to the bringing into captivity of every thought to the 
obedience of Christ. Now that's always been there. To all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given the Holy Spirit of Christ without measure. So now we know the secret of receiving what Jesus is. We obey what he says. And we are given his Holy Spirit to do that. 1 SM 396. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. In other words, he understands what God says. God says obey, and he with his heart obeys. No one can believe unto the heart with righteousness and obtain justification by faith while continuing the practice of those things which the Word of God forbids. If we know that's what God forbids and we continue to do that, we do not get justification. Do you see that? Or one neglecting any known duty. This section in 1SM is full of these statements telling us how to be, how we can be a Christian. And nowhere does it say, keep sinning. Nowhere. Keep doing things you know God said don't do. Faith and work, 16. Let this point be fully settled in every mind. If we accept Christ as Redeemer, we must accept him as our ruler. He's our king. He's our master. He's our ruler. We cannot have the assurance and perfect confiding trust in Christ as our Savior until we acknowledge him as our king. That seems so simple. And our obedient, there it is, <laughs> to his commandments. Do you see how this word obedience is always in the plan of salvation? There is no such thing as a person coming in, continuing with sin. We must be obedient to Jesus. We have accepted him as king. We have surrendered. 1SM 325. How willing is Christ to take possession of the soul temple if we let him? He is represented as waiting and knocking at the door of the heart. Then why does he not enter? It is because the love of sin has closed the door of the heart. As soon as we consent to give sin up. How come people don't talk about giving up sin? Because they don't think it's possible to acknowledge our guilt to barriers removed between the soul and the Savior. There is salvation. The barrier is removed. The door can be opened. He comes in. That takes care of it. 3T257. By those who heeded and zealously go about the work of separating their sins from them in order to have the needed graces will be the opening the door of their heart that the dear Savior may come in and dwell with them. Review and Herald, January 24th, 1893. Some will not make a right use of the doctrine of justification by faith. So here's the danger for those who think they have justification by faith. They will present it in a one-sided manner. This was A.T. Jones making everything a faith and belittling works. Others will seize the points that have a leading, leaning toward error and will ignore works altogether. So there's a danger in justification by faith. We think because Jesus justifies us, that's the whole plan of salvation. No, we need to talk about sanctification yet. We need to talk about glorification. That's coming. All right, we will finish with this one. SD 288. Until the heart is surrendered unconditionally to God, the human agent is not abiding in the true vine and cannot flourish in the vine and bear rich clusters of fruit. And the Christian knows this. God will not make the slightest compromise with sin. So we see a Christian is somebody who in their heart and head have given up sin. 
They are not making any excuses. They know God will never compromise with sin. They are Christians. They're still people. They can make mistakes. Yes, they can make mistakes because of giving up faith for some reason. They can do it. They can sin. No one is ever going to say that a person who becomes a Christian will never sin. No one has said that. We have never read that. But a Christian has given up sin. They have ceased from sin. And all these statements we will be reading prove that they have no room for sin except through some terrible mistake. Watch out for that. We will read the statements that will tell us that. If we think we're Christians, let us give up doing things we know are sin before we do them. We know it. There's no reason to do it. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Father, we thank you. We don't need to stay out where there's no remedy. We've come into the sanctuary now. We're in the holy place where there's a brazen altar, where there's a place for sacrifice, where there's a labor. Let us see these things. Let us prepare our hearts to understand that we're living in the most holy place.